You look beautiful, boys. <laughs> Mike. And I'm Danny. And this is Petrol Revolt. Welcome back to Petrol Revolt. In this episode, we have something four wheels and we have something out of a British stable. This is the stable of the West Midlands, the now unfortunately deceased Austin Rover or Rover Group. That car company gave us some true iconic great cars. There was the classic Range Rover, the Isagonis Minis, and the SD1 series. What we have for you today is a twin turbo, or turbos. These are like what my uh what my grandma used to drive they look like. Well steady on, these are pretty special cars. No, in all seriousness, I do know that you know they've got uh, they've got some character about them, and and they are some pretty special cars. So, uh, so Mike, I'm particularly looking forward to to driving this car, um, as I'm not the most technically minded, and I'm not from. I'm gonna have to go to the older generation like yourself to ask more about this car because, uh, frankly, it looks cool. It's got turbo written on it, and I just want to drive it. Um, so, yeah, can you tell us a bit more about it? Well, steady on, saying that a maestro is cool could ruin your street cred. But this is a, a particularly special car. Uh, the Austin Rover Group came out with a maestro and Montego in something like 1983. And before they moved on to that generation of car in the late 80s, early 90s, they just wanted to spice the brand up a bit. So they released a hot hatch. And at the time, you know, mid to late eighties, every car company had their own hot hatch. So Rover wanted a bit of that pie. So this is a special edition. It was uh, designed and styled by Tickford, who did the Tickford Capri. Uh, there's quite familiar lines and um, shapes of the body kit on this car that you can see exist in a Tickford Capri. Uh, the, obviously it's a, a base maestro, which was the Austin Rover Group, and the engine was designed, developed by uh, Austin Rover. Uh, it was Tickford doing the external body styling. It's a really special engine in this car. It's turbocharged and it's carburetor. There are very, very few turbo carburetor cars ever released. It's quite trick to do that. A carburetor doesn't lend its hand to being pressure charged. Uh, it produces about 165 bhp. The car weighs in about 1050, 1100 kilograms. And those stats led to Austin Rover producing this advert that will ping up now. I mean, literally, this car 0 to 60 was faster than a Ferrari, Lambo, Aston, and a Porsche. It was the Ferrari Mondial at the time that was out. Uh, 0 to 60 of that car was bang on seven seconds. 0 to 60 of this old timer low sixes so it truly was faster than a ferrari well like you just said with with the horsepower and, and the weight of it it's it's going to be it's going to be a good car well it's going to be a fast car and obviously the wheelbase is is short on it um so it's going to be nimble and it looks with the stats you've just told me it sounds like it's going to be awesome to drive but they're they're still nowadays they're a very rare car aren't they so do you know how many of these cars still exist yeah this car is super rare even if you go to an austin rover car club meet uh there'll be montegos maestros minis metros uh, maestro turbos you'll see some because there are quite a few restored cars uh, they made 505 of these in total and because they became the criminal's escape weapon of choice uh, this car did earn itself the title of the most stolen car in England at one point in time in the early 90s. But there's often stories of any Austin Rover car failing its MOT, well, its first MOT on corrosion. Uh, corrosion rips through these cars. So a lot of them uh, were off the road because of uh, rotting themselves to pieces. They were crashed. And back in the day, they, they weren't really that loved. Now they've become uber cool 80s retro cars. And I'd definitely say 
there's less than 100 of these on the road. You probably find tax tested and actually usable like this one is. We're probably less than 50. So look, I mean, I suppose in comparison, you know, we've done some stuff on the RG500 and a little bit like that, you know, they wasn't that a lot of people loved them in a day, but there wasn't that many. And, and like uh, Suzuki wanted to, you know, they'd done the Pepsi and the, the Skull Bandit one to try and sell more. But now the RG is, everyone wants one. So I suppose this is a, a little bit like that, but in, in the car world. Yeah, you're right. It's extremely similar. Uh, a model which was flagging in sales, a car company that needed to pep the whole brand up, done something pretty outrageous uh, just to give the brand uh, a, a little bit of presence in the marketplace. Um, it's very similar to the RG in terms of there's far too much power going on for what the chassis and brakes can handle. And, and it, it more or less is the essence of an American muscle car an outrageously powerful motor in chassis and brakes that really, really can't tolerate it, uh, which just makes it a fun package. Well, I love riding the RG. Um, so, you know, if, if it's if it's going to translate this car, you know, the RG into this sort of car, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what it can do around a track. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you drive this car because I'm sure you'll get your eye in for how it handles, uh, what the brakes are like. And then that first time that you give it full throttle and go on boost, I just can't wait to see your face. So that's the MG. Um, can you explain a little bit more about this Rover? I have, when, when I was growing up, there was a game called uh, Toka Touring Car Game. And, um, and I'm sure like this sort of model featured in that. And, and they done, I think they done like a support series, didn't they, around this model of car. But that's literally all I know about it. So, um, can you tell me some more about it? Yeah, that was a good spot. This car was uh, entered as a support race to the touring cars. So again, what Rover wanted to do is give the brand exposure. And when this model was, was launched, obviously this is the 220 Turbo, so it's their top of the range model. There were 1.6 engines and a naturally aspirated two liter engine in that coupe uh, body, but they made something like 35 or 40 220 turbo race cars and they were a support race to the early mid 90s touring car challenge so yeah it was quite cool to see rovers bashing around supporting touring cars it it, it did work for them it gave them uh, some presence that they wouldn't have had before but this particular car doesn't really need uh, any introduction into the marketplace those who know their stats uh, know that this car weighs in at about 1150 kilogram. The motor is about 200 brake horsepower and it's, it seems strange to say it because the Escort Cosworth has just gone off in another direction. Uh, but at the time that this was released in the early to mid 90s, th this car is comparable with the Escort Cosworth. Now the Escort Cosworth 0 to 60 accelerates two tenths of a second quicker to 60 than this car but the ultimate top speed of this car over the Escort Cosworth this wins hands down and you know at that time it's a little bit of an unfortunate story for the Rover Group it was acquired by BMW and then ultimately destroyed by BMW and BMW stopped this car it, it scared them it's it's bordering on three series uh, performance figures and they put a stop to it. That 200 brake horsepower motor was killed. And what went in that car afterwards was a 150 horsepower variable valve time motor. It, it, this car was going to achieve great things for the brand. Rover would have gone on to the next step. You know, I really like this picture that we'll show you now. Uh, this is peak Rover. Uh, this is from the mid 90s. You've got the classic Mini, the Rover. 100, 200, 400, 600, 800 series. Obviously the versions that they spun from the 200 chassis to create the Tourer, the Coupe, and then you've got all the Range Rover and, and Defender models. Rover just needed one more iteration of uh, design and new models, and they would have transformed themselves from the dark days of Itel, Marina, 
and those sorts of cars. Montego, Maestro sort of helped turn a corner from those marinas and uh, ambassadors and princesses. And then it was this sort of Honda chassis derived car, which took them to the next level. Um, it's interesting that you mention the touring car support race, because as you can probably see, it's sit, sat on some different rims. They are actually the rims from the race car. And underneath that car is the race car's uh, poly bush setup, anti-roll bar bushes, Coney adjustable dampers. So, you know, we're, we're behind some mega sports supercars here. You wouldn't have thought this Rover could do it, but it will outhandle supposed sports cars. And the motor's just got so much pull to it that if we weren't restricted by speed limits, then that thing will easily hit 150 mile an hour super quick. This one, its party piece is 0 to 90. Uh, and 0 to 60, these cars are, are quite similar. Uh, that car's party piece is 90 to 150. The gearing, the engine power, everything is just awesome. That's the other thing. I mean, people like from my generation would probably look at this and think, oh, it's a Rover, because that's what like my generation thought, because that's like what you just said, uh, BMW turned it into, you know, just, uh, just a bit of a family car, you know, um, and that's what we sort of looked at. That's how we looked at it when I was growing up. So I'm looking forward to knowing, especially that it's the it's the turbo, and you've got all these modifications done to it. So I'm looking forward. Well, I'm looking forward to driving them both out on the track, and and equally, I'm as excited to drive this as what I am this. So um, so yeah, I'm 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 excited to drive both of them and. You know, it's not, for my generation, it's not what it looks like. You, like you say, people who know Rovers will know about this car. But from my generation, yeah, it's, um, this, this is something special. So I'm, I'm looking forward to showing the people what it's like around the track. Well, it's really interesting in the generations how some people class the cars as uber cool and some would just laugh at it. Uh, but as these cars turn classic and there are not many of them left. Uh, and as the K-series head gasket problems, cars breaking down when they pick them up from the dealership, as those people sort of get older and a younger generation that didn't know how bad these cars were, just look at the shapes. You know, look at the shape of this one. It's ultra cool 80s retro. Then there is a lot of love for these cars. Uh, fill this up with petrol. You'll always get people coming over and taking a picture of it. Yeah, we'll take them out on the road. Uh, we'll take them around the track. I think this car is probably not going to be at home on the track, but because of that car setup uh, around the track, that should give a really decent account for itself and, and be held up to any scrutiny on a, on a car's modern day level in terms of handling and braking and performance. Obviously, refinement, there's none. Wind noise, terrible but just on driving dynamics, pleasure, uh, the character that both of these have got. The, the, you just want to keep coming back to driving these cars rather than quite plain vanilla modern day cars. They've really got charm about them and something that just, when you sit in the car, start the ignition, drive off, just put a big smile on your face that modern day cars don't. Well, I reckon it's, it's about time we stop talking about it and uh, we get behind the wheel and, and try them out. Well, the only thing to ask first is which one? Do you want to go retro or do you want to go the newer style? Uh, personally, I prefer to go retro. Well, let's get the Maestro warmed up and take her out on the road. Let's get going. <laughs> well, come on then, start her up. It's not starting, mate. Have you got uh, have you got breakdown cover then? Because I want to get home later. <laughs> well, it's obligatory with a British Leyland car. You have to have breakdown cover. Come on, let's try it one more time. Turn the ignition on then. Right. Give her a bit of a rev up. This makes me feel like a boy racer. Now remember the Morgan that we drove, the turning circle on that was terrible. This ain't much better. Right. Brakes. Fucking you hell. wanna check your brakes. Sorry. You <laughs> brakes aren't very good, are they? <laughs> I 
touch and he's warming up gently so that gives you ideal opportunity just to check out steering braking get the feel for her Hi, for a 32-year-old car. I'll tell you what, them brakes aren't good at all, are they? <laughs> for a 32-year-old car... I, it drives good, it does drive good, I must say. Smooth, anyway. Just to show you about the brakes. Do the brakes get any better as they get warmer or not? Uh, if anything, they get worse. Oh dear. Yeah. yeah. Disc brake front, drum brake rear. Oh, another Morgan. We're yeah. not in the Morgan now. They'll give them a wave. Disc brake front, drum brake rear, uh, drum brakes, yeah. Things of the devil, really. No feedback, prone to leaking. Pretty bad idea. No, it actually drives, um, actually drives nice. It one for the brakes, and obviously the interior, and like you know, like it, it looking old, you wouldn't actually driving it, you wouldn't think it's an old car, would you? What do you think this would do for your street cred then, if you turned up in the in the hood in this? I don't know. I don't know because my um, my mate had a used to have a toy. Um, is it Toyota Scarlet? Oh yeah. Like he used to have one of them and he's, a lot of my mates are into their cars and stuff like that. So it, it probably actually do my, my street cred good with them, but not good anywhere else. But it's one of them things, isn't it? Unless you know, unless you know it, then you wouldn't know that it's it's this sort of car, would you? You wouldn't know that it's rare and it's, I mean, like it's got its number down there of how number 330 of 505, so it's a rare car as it is. But I bet there's not 505 left of them, do you? Oh, we're down to, uh, I wouldn't say single figures, but I doubt there's going to be more than 100 left uh, capable of having an MOT and tanks on them. That's the thing, and this, I mean, this is in mint condition, isn't it? So, it's been well kept. Whoa! <laughs> That's the torque steer. Oh, it's quick, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> oh, the brakes are useless. <laughs> it's got the power, but then when you go and stand on the brakes to try and stop, it don't want to stop. Do it up if you want. I compared to modern car performance, it doesn't let itself down, does it? It it's... does, like the actual performance of the engines, it's flipping incredible, but the brakes just. The brakes are the scary bit about it. It's a little bit, um, like, it's a little bit floaty, you know, like wobbly, you can't really feel much. It don't feel planted to the ground, but the power of it's, like, maybe I shouldn't say this to people are doing, but, you know, you're not going slow and it's still pulling. Oh, this pulls, if you get it on a track, it will pull all the way up to 130 mile an hour, but at 90 mile an hour, if you watch the bonnet, that's very alarming. The amount of movement going on on that bonnet is like a crazy amount that you only think that it's going to lift up and fly off. So 90 is probably a comfortable limit. Yeah, you want to be yeah. standing on the anchors about now. Jeez. Them brakes are not good. 
We've got a little boost gauge down there, look. Right. We go to about 15 psi at maximum. There we go. Oh. <laughs> it just puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? Probably the limit of the limit you, of the handling. Yeah, you would you wouldn't want to um, <laughs> you wouldn't want to go fast over a crest of a hill because you don't know when it's going to land again. <laughs> it just feels a bit floaty. I tell you what, though. Uh, it's fun to drive. Oh! oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Well, for me, you know, I'm an engineer and I feel and notice anything that's not quite right. Is it a wheel bearing? Is there a suspension joint clonking? And all the time you just, oh, is that something wrong? Is that something wrong? And whenever I drive this car, every single moment in it, you think well, something's wrong, something's wrong. And then you think, no, it's just the maestro. They're always wrong. Nah, you're gonna have to wait until he goes. You clear, you clear? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not, you're not, put it this way, I'm not confident um, on the road in it, with the handling side of things, but the power of it is very impressive. For uh, what year is this car? Uh, 1990 this one, they For made them between about 88 and 91, the 505 specials. Yeah, for a 1990, late 80s car, the power in it's pretty, pretty special, isn't it? But I tell you what, it's the first time I've drove like a, a small, a small hatchback turbo car, and it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice. The power on it's nice. I like the power on it. Actually, how safe you feel in it going fast is a different matter, but. It's definitely got a character to it. it. It's it's a real charming car. The smile that it brings on other people's faces is is priceless. It's that smile that maybe a guy in his forties when he sees it smiles because you know that he's seen the car and it's just brought back memories of him being taken to school in it. It it's just got a lot of charm. This car. But even even like for me when I got in it and I and I you know I I booted it. it it put a smile on my face. <laughs> so I think for anyone it'll put a smile on their face. It's just got that, it's got that acceleration and I suppose where it is quite, it's very light. I suppose that's why it's a bit like a, it's a little bit like a go-kart, isn't it? I suppose in a way. I like that, you can hear the turbo as well. What about your 80s seat for comfort? Yeah, They good. don't make seats like this anymore, do no, they? No, a this nice is, comfy seat this is. Almost like a wing back armchair this is. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's, it's, a, bit like, it's a bit like your granddad's armchair. You're gonna sit at your granddad's house and you sit in the armchair and you just sink into it. So this program is twin turbo, so now we're just about to get into his younger brother. So that is a 200 horsepower turbo, whereas this is 165 horsepower turbo. Right. 
and that Rover 220 turbo weighs about, I don't know, it depends on the fuel load, probably about 1150 kilogram. This is about 1000 kilogram. So on paper, the 220 turbo should actually be a lot faster than this, but there's something about this, whether it's the gearing, uh, just that naught to 60, naught to 90 is just incredible on this, isn't it? The, yeah. You know, the, the torque steer, where it just shoots off in any direction, it, it's random each time. It is, you can't, like, you, I think the one problem with this car is you can't tell which way it's going to go. <laughs> That's the worst thing about it. And the brakes are terrible on it. Every time I go for the brake, it's like, is he going to come in, is he going to come in, and then it finally comes in. But when, when we get in the 220 Turbo, it's basically the same car company. The Rover 220 Turbo was the next car after this one, yet it, it's as if it was made by a different car company. The, the chassis, the seats, the brakes, just everything about it has moved on. Now, I know that this was British Leyland technology, and the 220 Turbo was Honda technology, but it's a huge, huge step change of car and technology for the what came out of the same car company. <laughs> That's not even done on purpose. <laughs> That's British sailing for you. <laughs> yeah. Ready? Right, let's see if we can avoid the breakdown truck in this one as well. Yeah, let's, let's do that because it didn't just start, did it? It's just that. Right, we ready? Let's go. See if I can pull away first. Oh, she needs a bit of warming up as well. Exhaust note sounds a bit fruitier on this one. Yeah, it does. It does sound a bit, a bit nicer. Oh, you good. The uh, biting point of the clutch is quite far out, isn't it? Oh, straight away you can feel this one almost rides a bit race car -y. Yeah, you can feel it's just, it's a bit stiffer. It's a, it's, I mean, you can feel the road in it. That's, the, it's quite a nice thing actually. Well, you know, like as being a, being a racer, like you always like to feel the road, whereas the other car, you just felt like <laughs> you was floating on top. It's got some good tires on this one. We've got Toyos on it. Obviously we've got polybushed anti-roll bar bushes, all suspension bushes, poly bushed up. Coney adjustable dampers, big brake kit on. Well, it's a, it's a Rover brake kit from a, uh, it's a from a Rover 600. The brakes are, but they retrofit on the 200 to give you bigger brakes. Uh, there's this quick. There's a quick shift mod done on that gear lever. Uh, when you start going through the gears, it should just need quite a little bit of throw just to go between the gears. It's quite good, and it, when you're on full throttle, you will have to grab the gears pretty quick. Um, I did notice that there wasn't, there's not much movement in the gear stick. Yeah. You know, for the for the, to select the gears. Ordinarily, this gear lever would sit a little bit higher. Yeah. And there'd be a lot more throw on it, so it's been reduced height and a short shift mod done on it just to make it a bit quicker. Uh, yeah. That's a two litre, the same as the Maestro. The block crank rods and pistons are sort of the same. It's an evolution. But whereas the Maestro was 8 valve, this is 16 valve, and this is fuel injection, whereas the Maestro was carburetor turbo. Yeah. So, and what what year what year is this? Uh, this is a 94 model car, but this model came out in 92. The 92 model didn't have an airbag and a steering wheel. We've got, we've got an airbag and steering wheel there. And then there was a later revision to this car. It lost this T-tray on the front and it had a an airbag for the passenger but this model didn't need that i prefer this i prefer the old school dash yeah uh, as compared to having it destroyed with an airbag 
Yeah, it's a proper old school dash, isn't it? I mean, this is quite a rare spec for a Rover. Leather interior, leather, the seats are piped, the interior door cards are piped red. It's actually got aircon, which does function. Uh, Rover never normally released cars at this high spec. Uh, this actual car was part of a group of 300 cars that were originally sold to Japan. Japan cancelled the order because they decided that these cars didn't pass their emission standard. They were sent back to the UK and then reworked as UK cars and that's why the spec of them is super high because uh, originally it was a car meant for Japan. Oh, right. Oh, you've got a little boost gauge on your right hand side there. Yeah. Boosts to about 15 psi. I mean, even though now we're going quite, we're not, we're going reasonably quick. Well, not very quick, but and it don't feel like it. And the brakes feel good. <laughs> Brakes feel a lot better yeah. than the other car. If you want to stand on them brakes and reduce speed quick, you can. Right. Let's get that turbo whistling. Oh, I tell you what, it's nice. And you know what? You don't get the wobbling like you got from the other car. It's very stable. You feel safe in it. Yeah, this will turn in precisely. Yeah, you feel real safe in it. Like, you, you, almost you can put the car wherever you want it to go. You could have some fun in this car, couldn't you? <laughs> it is a proper sleeper, because people that wouldn't know a Rover because the car company disappeared, uh, especially youngsters in whatever car they're in just think this is like a granddad's car or something old and fuddy duddy but oh like well like from my generation i never knew like they done they done a turbo they and this spec car if you had some little boy racer who wanted to to give you a bit of, try and give you a run for your money you could destroy him in this couldn't you easily Obviously, Rover British Laden, it made some terrible cars that have caused people a lot of pain to keep on the road with repair bills and failing MOTs and breaking down and stuff like that. But a car company that actually made a car like this in the mid 90s for not to be here today, that is a crime because this car is just such a peach. Uh, it's got a lot of character, it's, it's fast. Uh, the outside lines of this coupe, even today, are beautiful. It looks a real sharp car. And, and it's hard to think, why isn't that car company still in business when they made a product like this? Yeah, and, and there was, there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them. Like, when I was growing up, there was a hell of a lot of these cars around on the road. And now, to be honest, I didn't even realise Rover wasn't about anymore. <laughs> like. I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to uh, getting this round the track. Yeah, this round the track will give a good account for itself. Yeah. Because it will handle like it's on rails around that little track. Right, you can't have all your fun to yourself. I think it's time I had a little spin in Ronnie the Rover. You couldn't resist it, could you? No. Oh, you can hear the turbo whistle on this one, it's quite nice. Just get that little subtle whistle. 
and it's got the boost gauge on the side here. What is quite noticeable is if you give it a little bit of throttle, like now, just a little bit, you watch that boost gauge already at 2,500 RPM, it's got about 2 psi boost on, just with a little bit of throttle. Yeah. That's basically like running round in the 2 litre naturally aspirated car all the time on full throttle. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just giving positive manifold pressure immediately. That's why in this car it's actually quite difficult to cruise. It, it hasn't got cruise control because it's a Rover. Uh, so if you leave your foot just with a little crack of throttle on in top gear, you just find yourself slowly, slowly, slowly creeping up in speed. It just makes it really rapid to drive when you're on roads like this because you just give it a little bit of throttle and as soon as you've given it a little bit of throttle you've got you got another 10 or you got another 10 mile per hour yeah. you? it's like when you look down at the clock you don't realize but i tell you what, that's another good thing about the car you don't realize sort of how quick you're going because you don't feel like you're going that quick and you look down and you're going quicker than what you think yeah another thing i love about this car is the speedo um, it's got a little party piece and it's going to do about there, about 30 mile an hour. It wangs up and down. Let you, it lets you know it's analog. You're in an analog car because that speedo is driven by cable instead of it being digital. It's just a lot of fun, these cars. And back in the day, this, these cars were fun. The Rover 220 Turbo was a, a, a celebrated car, even back in the day when it came out new. It was, it was a good car, it was a quick car. Uh, it was only slightly slower than the Escort Cosworth 0-60, and it actually beat it on top speed. But, you know, you can drive around in Aston Martins, and they're fast cars, and they keep you safe, and they're refined. But when you jump in a car like this, and travel at a much slower speed. Uh, you just get much more sense of uh, thrill and enjoyment out of it, even you know when you compare it to driving an Aston. Yeah, as um, there's just a lot to be said for old school cars and the feeling that they give you. They got they got character, haven't they? Oh, you wouldn't show them, were you? 